Now, it's a complete uh, pleasure uh, to introduce our Locknote speaker. So this being the afternoon, we're now in the European morning time. We've got um, Mayuka Ninioha, who is a true API leader in Europe. Um, she heads up um, API Days Helsinki, and she does a lot of um, uh, consulting work around APRs in Finland, which is the most digitally advanced economy in Europe, I believe. And Mayuka is going to talk to us about API upcycles. So thank you very much, Mayuka. Thank you, and, and it's it's a wonderfully uh, kind of Spanish way of pronouncing my name. So it's Nini Oya, and thank you for uh, saying that Finland is very digitally oriented. Yes, we are, and, and we are also the happiest people in the world for, I don't know why, well, we'll just see. But I'm so glad to be here uh, talking about the APAP cycles, and let's see if I can get my uh, slides shared here. Uh, and it's also a nice time to say hi to my all my cousins in Australia, so if you're listening, <laughs> Um, pleasure to be here too. Now, API of Cycles uh, is about developing business and tech together. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about my experiences on, on uh, doing so and, and also uh, just kind of guide you through the method and, and especially the reasons why you should be using it. And First, a little bit about myself. So, as Saul already mentioned, I'm uh, I'm lo the local organizer of API Days Helsinki, and APAPS meetups. We have them in Finland, but but we also have them in US, um, and they are getting quite active there. So, I've been consulting and training, and also being the product manager, in-house product manager, and uh, architect of uh, many API programs. Although I still always say that I'm 25 years old, and that's the older, oldest I, I will ever get, um, I have been working with APIs, well, over 10 years, and actually around 20 years. We didn't call them APIs at the very beginning. Uh, they were web services, and, and we were building the uh, agriculture and forestry ecosystem and, and platforms for uh, European Union reasons when Finland was joining the European Union. That was my first catch on APIs. But since then, I've been involved in a lot of uh, private sector and public sector initiatives on APIs. The API cycles method is, is kind of my baby. I, I can say that I'm the mother of it and we developed it while I was, I was kind of catching up with some of the, my experience and trying to figure out why we had such, such good success in certain companies and trying to build a lot of different APIs with a lot of different teams from different companies. And then we kind of try to productize and try to capture the essence of it. And I'm going to tell a little bit about the background of why that is important. Um, also some stuff that we researched that we had in the API Economy 101 book, uh, which I co-authored a couple of years back. It's quite uh, a pack of research articles plus some practical experiences there and some stuff about APAP cycles too. Okay, so my first point to you, my first question to you, and you can even answer in the chat, is that are APIs and API development an art or science? Because this is what we hear a lot in a lot of conferences that, you know, it's an art or, you know, there's um, a, a kind of scientific reasons for it. Of course, there is fielding thesis. There is uh, a lot of kind of studies or at least pseudo studies or de facto uh, ways of doing APIs. But is it really a science? Uh, because a lot of people treat it as an art form and think that there is kind of a design um, aspect of APIs. And of course there is, but there is also a lot of science involved. And I want you uh, to look at a few pictures of, of uh, the world map on, on with me. And this is from a study about vi visualizing the geography of platform boundary resources. And this study was kind of looking into why there are certain locations 
in the world uh, where there are lots of APIs. This is from a few years back, 2016, I think, and they were analyzing programmable web APIs. So, of course, it's not all inclusive, but it is quite inclusive at the time. And they were finding that there is a reason why certain locations have a lot of APIs and certain points in the map look very empty. And actually what they found out was that the amount of APIs correlates with the global startup index and economic growth areas and that APIs drive in cultures where user-centered design is dominant. So actually what it means is that to have really, really great APIs and to really make business out of those APIs, you have to have a certain amount of co-location and certain amount of same mindset for marketers and developers, and that they have to actually co-create things. And interestingly, the kind of the perfect combination of mindset seems to be in Silicon Valley, while there are certain areas where uh, kind of things are quite not so kind of uh, co-located or not so successful, but they are like getting close. And it's interesting to see from the study, if we are looking at from an Australian perspective, that you have Melbourne here very close to the Silicon Valley, but then you have Canberra here, which is like quite far. And that's kind of an, an interesting thing that I have seen in real life with the uh, like even if we are so digital in Finland, there is still this big Nokia kind of engineering mindset that, you know, if you build, they will just come. And this is something that we have had to actively overcome in, in a lot of customer cases and, and in the kind of society as a whole. So the platforms and APIs should be used. Uh, I'm saying here are used, but should be used to build ecosystem customer journeys. And you should be able to build uh, kind of things like, for example, I was working in a big retailer and, and we were building a, a hardware retail store for three countries and we had a very little amount of time. And we really went ahead and, and looked for ready-made APIs and ready-made kind of platforms, but only also only single APIs that we were able to calculate things like, you know, shipping costs for, across different providers or, or handle payments or do product recommendations or do a variety of other things that you need actually in an e-commerce store. While we also found out that there were APIs that we just had to build ourselves, even though there were some product information or ERP or other systems underneath, but we had to kind of modify those APIs and combine different APIs. But it's, it was still faster to create a complete journey. And it was still from a kind of one company's point of view, but think about this as being a true ecosystem journey across a lot of different uh, providers and organizations where the same customer is getting served well, throughout the whole um, span of, of his or her or the company's need. So this is the power of APIs. If they are properly productized, if they are designed from a business perspective, and if the business model is developed uh, together with the APIs, like uh, we had to do in the retail case and in a lot of other cases. And so what I'm saying here is that you should put APIs into the right context. So a lot of people talk about, and, and companies talk about API strategy. We need to make an API strategy. A lot of vendors talk about API strategy. But what you actually have to create is a business strategy that includes APIs or where the APIs are the kind of core uh, competitive thing that, and, and the core thing uh, around the offering for your business. So the question then is that who, what is the team needed to build this? What is the team to kind of create the strategy? Uh, what is the budget and, and how do we get the buy-in in the organization to build and consume the right APIs? 
or bigger still even in an ecosystem. I'm going to show an example from water services as an ecosystem that we were uh, designing and, and, and building and there is going to be a lot of things in European Union uh, and, and on Finland uh, kind of level, but I heard uh, about the energy sector uh, in the panel here in, in API Days Australia, and there's a lot of stuff similar to that going on uh, in, in many places in the world. So then that's a question, how to build the partnerships that you need so that you don't need to build everything yourself. And ultimately, how do you technically and, and uh, kind of as a real product, as a software, how do you actually build those APIs and how do you build the stuff that you need for the developer experience to be the right? And this is where API cycles comes in. So it's all about collaboration between business and tech. So I was working in, in many companies and, and I kind of noticed that there, was, there were methods for UX design and UI design. There, were, there was DevOps, there was a lean startup, there was uh, a lot of software development methods. And that was actually one of the best things that happened when I was kind of starting in university and starting with uh, the 100 people team to build the European Union required uh, agriculture and forestry systems in, back in the days. Uh, we had a software development method and a kind of a rule book around it. It's, it might sound very old fashioned, uh, it might sound non-agile, but actually it really helped us to focus on what we needed. But it wasn't really business oriented and a lot of it wasn't really APIs oriented. It, it was just something very general or very specific for the user interface. And so I kind of came up uh, with the idea that we need a method for this. We need to solve this in some way that is repeatable and can combine all of these different people who have their different knowledge and different skills and different language and, and make them work together. And so ACAP Cycles method kind of was born from a uh, lean startup, uh, from the business model canvas, uh, minimum viable architecture was invented uh, early on, but it wasn't really adopted anywhere that much. Um, DevOps and kind of the developer experience part of it. And also we found out that there was a problem that even if the APIs were built in a very good manner, in a technically good manner and, and with the right kind of restful or well, graphical <laughs> or some other principle, the problem was that they were not often manageable. So, for example, they were not secure. They were not uh, described with, a, with an open API or RAML or any kind of standard spec. They were uh, having lots of issues in terms of status codes and overall design. And, and for example, they were not uh, kind of... <laughs> They were not good from an open, open standard point of view, from the security standard point of view. But most of all, the problem was that all, all companies were starting to introduce API management tools. And these APIs that the really great development teams were developing were never uh, actually publishable right away via an API management tool because of all these issues and because of some versioning issues uh, and, and related to even if they were using some standards, maybe the standard was not properly used or validated, or the standard was not the same level of a standard like Open API 2 versus Open API 3 or something as the API management tool was using. So a lot of issues that uh, resulted into a lot of lean management point of view waste, basically. So. Open Cycles relies a lot of, on lean management. It helps you to remove the eight wastes of lean. There's even an ebook that um, you can get if you register for the API of Cycles subscription list. So it's about removing the eight wastes of lean. And it's also about open development. So 
the method itself is openly standard uh, uh, licensed. You can use it um, however you want, but is that you need to use it with the right people in, and in the right way to really get these benefits. And you need to understand a little bit about like this DevOps or business development, lean startup uh, kind of way of developing business and products. You need to understand product management, minimum viable API architecture is there. So you kind of have to have some idea of architecture, somebody in the team needs to have it. And lean principles won't hurt. So of course you don't need to know all of this when you start out, but this is the kind of uh, stuff that somebody in the team really needs to start understanding or want to learn. We have a Slack channel that we just started to kind of really facilitate this discussion. And the interesting thing is that there, there are a lot of people um, in a lot of places I wouldn't have dreamed of, uh, for example, in, in uh, Latin America and, and, uh, and all kinds of parts of Europe and, and US. And, and I, I sincerely don't know if there's anyone in Australia already using this, but uh, what they are saying in, in the Slack channel, for example, is that they really understood the need for business and customer and user uh, kind of mindset in building APIs. And, and they, this was the way that they could combine lean startup with API development. And I, I, I'm so glad because that was exactly the point of it. So API cycles is not just for developing one single API. You can actually make uh, an API strategy or, or uh, create a kind of full set of business model for a small company or business unit at a time uh, for with it. And you can actually plan an API management tool rollout with it because it kind of directs you to all the also the non-functional requirements that are very key in understanding how to roll out what are the requirements for the API management tool too. And of course it can be used also for kind of not building APIs, but understanding which APIs are already existing and which you can kind of buy, steal or borrow. And it's all about collaboration. So oftentimes I hear people complaining that okay um, I need to understand all of it. Like for, from, from a business point, a person, I've heard that, hey, I don't understand these requirements templates that the method has because there's a lot of uh, architecture there. And they are understandable also for a business person, but they do need somebody a little bit more technical to kind of really go through with the idea and, and discuss the ideas with you. So it's it's kind of better than having an enterprise architecture uh, diagram or something very specific. There are kind of children's uh, coloring book uh, style templates, but you do need to have these different people in the room and, and in the Zoom or wherever you are doing it um, to really get the benefits of it. So if your API team looks like this, uh, which is kind of, you know, all male developers from a single kind of mindset and, and experience, this is not a good way to start with the whole uh, API cycles journey or any API productization journey. So you need to really invite whoever you need to like business people, different people thinking different things, customers, partners, um, uh, architects, developers, security people, sales, marketing, whoever you need there in the room to really think about your kind of partner strategy, your customer experience, your business models, and, and the APIs that benefit um, all those. So the point is invite everybody, get them cake, drink something, or, or you know send them chocolate in the post or something if you are remote. Yeah, so, so there, that's the idea. And uh, then let's look a little bit about the actual method. So APAL Cycles is built on the can uh, canvases and templates. So you start with a, a model of a value prop canvas, uh, which is kind of stolen from Osvalder and, and guys, but it's it's modified a little bit to fit the API specific needs. And then um, you go ahead and 
use it for the kind of API management technology planning or the non-functional requirements. So you look at one API at a time, even if you need to iterate a little bit, and you start with API strategy, and then you use the, the canvases for non-functional requirements. So business impact, capacity locations, and data systems. And basically, then you have also canvases for the API design, specific like request response models and information and data architecture stuff there. Uh, the point of this is that you should be starting API first. So if you have a service design or some kind of business design team and you they are doing all those customer journeys and, and post-it notes or whatever they are using uh, right now, so you should start the API development at that same time or at least after that uh, time. So traditionally, when building digital applications, you will have these kind of uh, user interface designers and UX designers coming in after the customer journeys are developed. But here you need to involve the API team, the, the people uh, who are involved with APIs with the business development team and start working on these canvases even first or on parallel with the UX and UI design because they actually impact each other and the result will be remarkably different if you start the API part only after the business modeling has been done already or after the UX UI design has been done um, already. So one thing to note is that the method is technology agnostic. It doesn't care what kind of APIs you are building or with what programming languages or something else. There is a REST API design guide there specifically, but it can also be used for uh, graphical APIs and others. There's a link uh, there in the method for a blog post where we kind of compare how, how uh, REST and graphical APIs and API management should be sort of together. So basically, if you want to start with it, uh, just add three ingredients. So current business goals, end customers and the right people together. And this is the example from what the services I, I told about. So basically this is a, a model of all the players in a, a, a real water system, water services ecosystem case. There's a lot of construction and building and all kinds of other uh, people there are consumers, but then there are also a lot of partners and, and these partners were actually essentially the uh, people or companies that uh, the water services providers were not thinking of. They were thinking they need to build everything themselves. And the whole thing was about how to introduce smart metering to water services because it is in energy sector, but it isn't that common yet in, in water services. And so that means that there will be a lot of a lot more data. Uh, a lot of it will be kind of very security oriented data and a lot of it will be just kind of the consumption data that needs to be in the hands of the building owners and consumers so how to handle all of this and the first question that was discussed was that what are your business goals what are the technical goals what are you trying to achieve and then kind of modeling the kind of high level roadmap and vision of of what are the goals of the water services ecosystem I'm not going to go to this deeply because the point is just to show how to use the AFAS cycles here so in a traditional customer journey and systems way you would kind of think about this as okay these are the water services provider systems these are somebody else's systems and it's not our problem how the customer journey is actually served and made so if we change perspective if we look at it from a kind of data hub company point of view what would the api consumer needs to be in um, for the border services data so we look at these few steps here about service pipe locations remote water metering consumption data gathering and analytics so we would api find those and we would just concentrate on serving those uh, capabilities so if you start using the APAP cycles method, um, we'll actually start from the kind of API value proposition canvas after the customer journey. There are some directions here that you can check in the slides later because we are a bit rushed with the time. 
But so identify one to five potential APIs, and this is how it looks like. So you start from the kind of jobs to be done or tasks, however you want to kind of figure out what the API consumer application and, and providers are doing, or consumer um, developers are doing. And then you start figuring out what are the gains for them having an API? What are the pains that they might be afraid when uh, figuring out if they should use somebody else's API? And then you start looking into, as an API provider, what gain and en en enabling features you should use to kind of really get to those benefits and what pain relieving uh, features you should have to uh, get to those, uh, to remove those pains. And this is a very big point in kind of outside in. So if you start modeling this way from the consumer needs, uh, you will get remarkably better APIs and with lower cost and with low, uh, less time than the other way around provider first. And then you can combine those features into services or into APIs and figure out what already exists and what you need to have. This all should take about half an hour or two hours at least for the first round. And then you can iterate with after uh, starting to do the business model canvas, which where you plan the developer experience and, and more potential API consumers for it, the revenue streams and costs. And this is typically the um, canvas that needs that business and IT together discussion. And that will provide a lot of a lot different results than having only IT or only business discussing this. I can assure you, I could have a lot of good examples on that. So just to kind of finish off on this, so risk and governance are built into the model. You should look at them from every single individual uh, API's point of view. Um, so what if the API becomes unavailable, security fails, or it works incorrectly, kind of who dies, or, or is there some other risk, and how to mitigate that on a business level? And then there are some other templates that you can use to really understand uh, what can cause failure, what kind of compliance issues you will have, what kind of capacity you need to plan for from a business goal perspective. And then just iterate. This is the minimal viable API architecture uh, steps here. And so if you want to get more information, go to the apipcycles.com site. And uh, we have also some online courses. But please join the APAP Slack channel to get some tips and extra material and join the conversation. That's all I have for today. Or any questions, I will be glad to answer. Hey, Mariuka, thanks for that. Great, great presentation. Um, so we've got a question from Diraj asking about security risks. And yep. he's saying that security risks are often ignored in early API integration. How to envision that this is going to change to address the mm -hmm. security risk in the API lifecycle, especially now with the new normal or the next normal? <laughs> Yeah, well, the security risks are kind of on a lots of levels. So first, the the model is or the method is is trying to coach you into thinking of the security risks from a business risk point of view. So not all risks are worth solving with tech or with the APIs, uh, and that is actually something that confuses a lot of times the architects or the developers because they either tend to ignore those these risks or don't know about them, or they think that every risk needs kind of a technical solution, which then drives the cost high. But on a kind of other note is that you, of course, have to um, think about the general risks of like what the OVASP top 10 or something tells you to, and then those are actually the biggest failures in any time, in normal or otherwise. Those are the ones that I see a lot like, just the authentication fails or, or is not suitable for the purpose. So API keys are not suitable if you have like a really big risk of, of exposure of private information. Right. But then when we think about these weird times we are living now in is that you have to figure out all the time 
when you launch and when you iterate and when you relaunch and you kind of build on the APIs and, and things change around you, you need to figure out if your model and your ways of dealing with things are suitable for the occasion. So for example, at this point with COVID, for example, we have seen a lot of companies have having to go digital really, really fast or scale up really, really fast. And that means that in a worst case scenario, a lot of internal APIs might suddenly have come, become public APIs or partner APIs. And, and a lot of APIs that were not used that much have suddenly been getting a lot more adoption. And there is uh, there are a few cases that I won't name here <laughs> where that has exactly happened and the security threat has become much more bigger because a lot of a lot more companies are relying on those APIs now, but also there's a lot more exposure for those APIs and they are not built that securely. Yeah, great. Um, I'm interested in the the mechanism around the canvas that you do. So mm -hmm. you showed the canvas. Yeah. How do you go through that? Is that done in one session in a workshop with your cross-functional yeah. team or everybody from the business? Great question. So. Uh, there are different canvases there, and, and I have done a lot of cases where, like, within two days, for example, we've gone through all of those. Uh, but it does require some <laughs> sitting down, and and it, it does require a really clear kind of situation, a really kind of scoped down situation. Uh, more often, you will have about kind of four to, to uh, maybe six sessions if, if it's a really complex case where you will have first more business people involved uh, and you might go through the kind of value prop and the business model canvas and, and, and uh, the non-functional requirements related canvases and then maybe another session where you will then because you have like more information now you have kind of scope down what apis you are going to actually build and or what you are going to look cl more closely then you will invite more specific people like for example the people involved with those back-end systems or those particular developers or you know uh, particular partners or somebody else and then you will start doing the kind of more data and information uh, related things and and, and the more detailed requirements and then continue from that to prototyping and building and things like that. So overall, in a kind of focused uh, situation, you could handle things in, in about four, a uh, couple of hours workshops. Right. Okay. But, but the benefit so, is that no architect needs to go into their own room and just sit down and invent some requirements that <laughs> sometimes <laughs> happens. Yes, like we're all standing outside the room, knocking on the door, waiting for yeah. the, <laughs> waiting for the the swagger stick from the architect. Um, so it's yeah, so it's really you, you're taking a, a a broader business view and then whittling it down through a set of prioritizations into a more specific view around the key APIs to build. Yeah, I think there's uh, one question that kind of is about overcoming multiple integration challenges. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is a very uh, complex question in a way. <laughs> but yeah, I think that if you focus on, like, if you focus on doing the business requirements first, and then you kind of start having these really well-scoped use cases and, and, and scenarios and value propositions for the APIs, then your integration challenges are also much more clearer because a lot of times if you think about integration first if you think about you know i have this sap here and i need to get this product availability data to this other system it's a very kind of abstract question you you have a lot of a uh, lot of uh point to point integrations you don't actually know their business purpose you don't know their value prop you don't know why they are being used basically so you have this integration hassle and you don't know how to technically design it because you don't actually know the business requirements so yeah. i think that kind of as a short answer that would be the the solution I, i've seen this being the solution to that integration situation yeah. okay 
We've got another question from Jon. Um, designing APIs that orchestrate calls to downstream systems by mm. different vendors often takes place without live links and relying on interface specs only. In your experience, what can be done in the earlier phases of API design that can mitigate some of the risks? And I, I think that relates to a, a, a question I had as well about, you yeah. talked about the UX and the API design being done mm -hmm. in parallel. How do you sequence yeah. those things properly? Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, it do comes down to a bigger point of productization and product management. And uh, as to the integration question earlier, this is also kind of, it's about really focusing on what is the product that you're building and what purpose uh, should that product kind of serve, because not all things are going to be served. I and mean, you need to, like, instead of just focusing on single requirements from single customers or use cases, you need to kind of think about, okay, these are, these can I, uh, I can combine to this API, but these are not here now and they will never be here as features and these will be kind of in the roadmap for the next iteration. So a very strict practice of product management is needed. And here, uh, to uh, answer Jorn's uh, question is that you have to, in the early stages of API design, you have to really figure out, okay, this is the value prop for this API, this is who we are going to serve with it, and this is the road that kind of product vision for it, and stick with that as much as you can. As you can. Uh, for kind of your point, Sol, is that uh, the what are, what is the right sequence? I would say that when you have that common business or product vision uh, for the kind of, if you're building a, a, an application or you're building a platform, you have kind of that product vision there. And even if you are just building the APIs, you still to have to have the product vision for the APIs, even if you don't know exactly where, what are the kind of larger products where it's going to be used. But you have that product vision. And so then you can have uh, the, single value prop and you can have the kind of, okay, these are the value props for the APIs, these are the value props for the end users. And then you can start from having the iteration of the UX UI design and the API design either in parallel or you start with the API design and the API kind of you go to the value prop and the business model level at least and maybe the in information design and then you involve the UX and UI people. I know that this is horrible thought for a lot of people, <laughs> and this is maybe the biggest change for the kind of digital uh, developers out there. And probably a lot of UX and UI designers are going to kind of threaten me with something, but this is what I've seen that it actually works. Because also, a lot of the UI designs tend to be very, very bad in terms of if you, if, the, if you start with the UI design, you will still need to iterate with the UI and API design because a lot of times the UI designs end up, if you start from there and you then design the API, you will have very unperforming UIs or underperforming APIs or very kind of complex stuff. But in the end, it's still you need to work together uh, with that. You need to kind of also think about what is this particular UI or other API consumer, if, it, if it's a dishwashing machine or something. You need to kind of figure out what are the specific requirements of those API consumers, because it will be different if it's a mobile app or a house appliance or something, so. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I've seen a lot of kind of customer experience first mm. working backwards um, yeah. design end up with very siloed channels. So you end up with, you know, a web channel and a mobile channel and a partner channel, yeah. and they're all just um, siloed copies of each other with a lot of, um, not a lot of reuse, et cetera. And I, yeah. and I think yeah. that, that, that's, that kind of leads to that kind of anti-pattern. 
and and it definitely is uh, if you have like mobile teams doing mobile like we had in in the retail case like we had first mobile teams developing a mobile app we had a web store team developing a web store thing and and some others developing some cash or register applications and and you you can imagine what those first apis which they did for themselves look like combined together they did not work together even the user management wasn't the same so no yeah. <laughs> okay all right um that's great so 